Welcome to Blending the Family, the podcast. Topics can range from dads hitting rock bottom, daughters watching their parents divorce, or even what is a good wine for couples to have while talking about finances. Here's your host, whose favorite wine is red and free, Tommy Maloney. Oh, let me take another sip before I do this. Mmm. Ah, good coffee. Good coffee. Hello, welcome to another episode of Blending the Family. I'm your host, Tommy Maloney. Try and be a little quiet because it's early in the morning. I'm watching the cars go by. On this episode, we're going to be talking to two wonderful, wonderful ladies who've created this ministry called The Starving Stepmom. And when I first started following them on Twitter, I was a little confused because I felt, oh, Starving Stepmom, it's about food. Wrong. Starving Stepmom is about what ladies need during rough times of marriage. And we're going to talk to Laura Beth and Melanie, and they're going to tell us more about their ministry. Now, hold on. You're going, oh, don't talk to me about God and faith and religion. This episode is a little bit more than that, but... Yes, there is an underlying theme, a little bit of tone about religion, because this is what these two wonderful ladies do. They minister to, as I believe it was Melanie talking about, being broken. You know, families end up being broken, and people like them are trying to fix the world of, in their vernacular, step, and in my vernacular, bonus. But either way, we're all trying to help you. And I hope you're trying to help others as well. Let me just bring up the show notes and tell you what we are talking about. So, for example, we're going to be talking about pain of the biological parent when having to pick between their own kids and their marriage. The question comes up again about should kids come first when you're dating? And you'll find a very interesting answer. The benefits of Premarital counseling, highly recommended. If you're going from divorce, you've been dating, and now you're going to be uh, putting together your blended family, I'm going to tell you, it's going to make life that much, not just easier, but better. All right, here we go. Our churches, uh, let me rephrase that. Do churches have a blind eye in the world of blended families? And we talked heavily about this. And this is from both their experience and my experience. Again, there is, we we are going to talk religion. But as you're, maybe maybe you can use this episode as, uh, one of my favorite apps is Headspace, a, a meditation app. And I love it, love it. Maybe this is, could be that. You could be sitting Sitting, using my Chicago accent there, sitting, nobody around, headphones on, just listening to this. And this could be your your meditation uh, for the day. Thanks for tuning in. Again, my name's Tommy. Find me at Tommy at BlendingTheFamily.com. Thank you so much for enjoying. Thank you so much for enjoying this podcast. Uh, I hope you do. Anyway. It's been a long day already. (laughs) I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Hold on. Let's just finish it the way we started. The Hangout is on the air and live, and luckily only the three of us can see it. The starving stepmom, the two ladies that are running this, would we say it's a business? It's a business, right? Ministry. 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 Yes. Thank you again for correcting me. You know what? I'm just going to step away. I'm going to let you two interview each other and I'll, uh, I'll just record it. You are outnumbered though, Tommy. I'm always outnumbered because I'm in a similar situation where I have, uh, any given day, three, three ladies in this household. And, um, yeah, but anyway, Laura Beth and Melanie, from the starving stepmom are here joining us on this podcast and I'm super excited even though there's a lot of estrogen in the in in the room virtually I have two male dogs right next to me and so 
There you go. It evens out. <laughs> it, I hope it evens it out. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much for joining me. I am super excited because I've uh, I've seen your tweets out there, or as the kids would say, on the Twitter. I don't know if they say that or not. And I'm I'm really excited about this because we're both in someone of the same space when it comes to blending families. And here's here's why I'm really excited. And it's not just the caffeine, but I'm out of caffeine. Is that you're coming? Uh, your your ministry is coming more of. I, I want to say more of a a female side, where I kind of come from the the male side. But there's commonality, and I love the commonality in that. It's going to be talking. Uh, part of this is talking about co-parenting, and I love it because. Uh, right before we hit record, we did talk about what is normal, what's not normal, and, and I feel like uh, I'm actually normal for once. <laughs> Laura Beth, I'm going to start with you and your family dynamics, and also we also want to mention that you're getting ready to move from our great state of Colorado to Ohio. Ohio, yes. <laughs> yep, we, um, that's why I'm in a blank room, because everything's out. Uh, the movers are... <laughs> Moving furniture as we're talking right now, and then we leave the state of Colorado and head that way on Friday. So, road trip. Yes, across the United States. <laughs> and you, all right. So let's talk about um, your family. You are, uh, you know, you have to excuse me, ladies. I'm not a fan of the word step. Um, my vernacular is always bonus. And so you'll have to uh, please don't throw rocks at me. But I, and we'll talk about why I'm. I don't like the word step. But what what's your family situation there, Lori? So for us, um, I have two biological kids that I brought in. My husband has two that he brought in. Uh, so we together we have three boys and one girl. Um, Three are grown and out of the house now, and our last one left uh, is 15. So, uh, biological mom and bonus mom. Well, it's funny because now you are moving, and if, even if they want to come back, <laughs> the locks have been changed apparently. So, you know. True. Um, so, the nice thing is that we will be very close distance to his biological daughter who has been living with her biological mom for three years now. So we'll be in much closer contact with her and that'll be nice. That's good. That's good. And Melanie, I know that uh, you came into a situation where you didn't have any kids and then all of a sudden, bam, you've got twins. Well, I mean, you didn't have to, well, you know. Yeah. I didn't have to have them. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> so keep going. So you, uh, two daughters um, with your husband or uh, bio, uh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. but yeah, you also my, husband, have- my husband brought twin daughters into the marriage. They were four when we got married. And then soon after, about seven months after we were married, I became pregnant and had, we have a little girl together. She's not really little anymore. She's eight and a half. Yeah. Uh, So we added another dose of estrogen to the already big dose of estrogen. Um, So we have three girls there. The twins are 14 and Abigail is eight and a half. And I want to continue on real quick, Melanie, is that, what what were the ages of the twins when you and Steve started dating, and what was that uh, relationship like? Um, you know, these past, you know, as as your marriage grew and as your relationship grew with the girls. Well, they were three when we met, and we met and dated and married fast and furious because um, we were in our forties. We didn't really want to waste any time. And we already knew what we wanted. <clears throat> so they were three when we met. Um, 
And parent and my husband has primary custody, so they were with us the majority of the time. They still are, um, and they see their biological mom every other weekend. Um, parenting them in the beginning, it's kind of done a role reversal. We had to deal more with their mother in the beginning um, because they were too young to speak for themselves. And now the roles have kind of switched, whereas they're teenagers now. So we leave the communication for the most part up to them to communicate with their mom. Um, unless it's something, you know, major, uh, we'll communicate or my husband will communicate with his ex-wife. But so the roles have kind of reversed a little, but it's, um, it's challenging. Laura Beth and I have had many a conversations um, I have a really good relationship with one stepdaughter and, and they're, they're twins. They're very, uh, much different, um, very fraternal. I have a good relationship with one. And then the other one, um, is challenging. She's got a, a, a real big loyalty bond with her mother, hmm. which I get. Um, but it makes it, it makes it tough. I'm happy you, you, you mentioned that Melanie and, uh, Laura Beth, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you on the same the same type of question, and in in my situation, ladies, it was my wife has two daughters, and um, the younger one who is about a, just over a year older than my son. Those two we kind of kid we call them the Wonder Twins because they really could be brother and sister. Other than the fact that my son has brown eyes, I mean they they're very similar. They just they they both are have that great heart. But it was the older daughter and I who who we don't have that strong of a bond. I tell people the story of when I was first dating my wife and I was taking uh, Betsy, the older one, to uh, a church event. And I tried to have that serious one-on-one -on -one conversation with her saying, hey, I'm not here to replace your dad. I know you have a great relationship with your dad. Uh, just like your mom is not here to replace uh, his mom. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, this is going to be a great conversation. And uh, she never looked up from her phone uh, as she was sitting there texting. But I, I think I got through to her eventually. Yeah. Yeah. So, Laura Beth, same question. What was your relationship like as you were dating your husband with the other kids? Um, the, the neat thing about all four of our kids together was that they got along really well, the four of them. Um, each one is uh, four years apart from the other. And so they never really were stepping on each other's territory uh, as far as their friends and their activities, um, even their schools, they were all in different schools. So that part, they didn't feel like they were losing their special place in the family. So that part was good. Um, um, my, my boys and my husband get along really well. Um, they have good relationships, and um, in the beginning, uh, it was a little easier. They were younger with my um, stepkids. Uh, they they were young and kind of just willingly opened their arms, and then as they started into junior high and high school, then that's when it just really became very hard, um, a very strained relationship. Their mom uh, put lots of pressure on them, uh, making them feel guilty for calling me mom. Um, and we had uh, primary custody of both of the kids um, until uh, his daughter several years back uh, wanted to go be with her mom. So uh, we did leave that decision up to her at that point. What was, I mean, coming coming from a, a dad perspective on that, that had to be hard for him. 
is very hard. Um, and it just the reasoning for her leaving was because of me. And, um, and that made it very difficult because he, you know, was feeling like he had to choose. And uh, it was, we are just now starting to be able to communicate with her again. And um, it, it's been a very long, very hard, painful journey with that. So, yeah. You know, as, as I'm listening to the story here, I know that you two have such a great special bond, uh, Melanie and, and Laura Beth. What was the the communication like between the two of you when, um, and, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I, I still feel that as men, we're still living in the in the fifties where we we can't open up. We're we're afraid to open up. We're afraid to cry. We're still we're still afraid to show our emotions and and, and fears. And I'm very blessed that my wife can read me. Some days she reads me too well. And again, Laura Beth, thinking about your husband and thinking about, oh my gosh, that's that's just one of those situations that's rough. But again, I know you two have a special uh, relationship where you not only did you two uh, contact each other, but you know you created the starving uh, starving stepmom uh, ministry. So again, how how do you two um, handle, or how did you handle that particular situation that uh, Laura Beth was going through? And I'll go to you, Melanie. Well. When you meet a stepmom, she's pretty starving to find out whether or not there's anybody else out there on this planet Earth that feels like she does. She just wants to know she's not alone. And that's really where both Laura Beth and I were when we met each other was she was in a really dark spot, dark place. And I was as well. And um, she reached out to me via Facebook. We were, we were acquaintances, but not friends. And she knew that my husband and I um, had a marriage ministry or a step. We, we held a small group through our church. And just on a, yeah, it was supernatural. It was divine. Mm -hmm. ordained. God just said, contact Melanie through Facebook. And she did. And we connected there. We had coffee. And I guess the rest is pretty much history. She, um, she poured her heart out to me and it was, it was, she was, she was in a place where she needed somebody to say, I'm going to grab your arm and I'm going to hold it and I'm going to help you get through this. And thankfully I was, I mean, I was blessed and honored enough to be that friend for her. Um, and through that God has restored and redeemed. And, and, and she's got an amazing story of, of redemption. Amazing. What God has done in her life um, individually and in her marriage but that's how we met. And I think that was probably three or four years ago. I lose track of time. But at that time, we were also struggling, my husband and I. Not that our marriage was bad. We were just struggling with the dynamic of how do you do this step family thing? How do you blend all of this together? We, we didn't know. Nobody gave us a handbook when we got married. Um, and so in my quiet time, one morning, God said, you need to write a book. Well, all, all that's going through my mind is you can't write. <laughs> what do you mean write a book? And for a week, he kept saying, you need to write a book. And I'm like, I am not writing a book. I refuse. You need to write a book. I mean, for like a week. So finally, finally, I said, okay, I'll write a book. But what do you want me to write on? He goes, just share your heart. And I said, oh, please, please tell me I don't have to do this by myself because there's no way I can do this by myself. I said, can I ask somebody to write this with me? And God said, of course you can. And I'm like, well, I don't need to go any further because I knew it would be Laura Beth. And I had just met Laura Beth like a month. Probably I hadn't even known her but a month. And that's when I contacted her and I said, okay, this might sound really strange, but God told me to write a book and he wants you to do it with me. And Laura Beth, what, what's that uh, conversation like on your end going, 
Um, do um, I need to get her a straight jacket? I mean, no. Um, I. So my family was literally falling to pieces um, because of what was happening with my stepdaughter. Um, and so we, the military was getting ready to move us from Austin back here to Colorado Springs. And um, my husband and his kids were in an apartment. And I was in the house by myself, and he kept saying, this isn't going to work. We need to split. And the Lord just um, miraculously, that's all I can say, just it was a miracle. He brought our family back together. And um, so when she contacted me, we had just moved our families back in together for maybe a week. And so I had this stepdaughter of mine that was in this house, not speaking to me um, and knowing that things were not good with that. And so my first, I, I was, I didn't feel like I was good enough to write the book. Like, who am I? It, it, you know, my stepmom journey right now is a mess. And um, so when I read the, her email, um, it just, it humbled me greatly. Um, and the Lord just said, Yes, your journey is a mess, but so is everybody else's. <laughs> and they need you to be able to be brave enough to step out and say, this is what's happening. And um, so, yeah, I think I prayed on it a couple of days, and then I got back to her and said, yes. So. Let me ask you to this, and I get a lot of flack for – matching this but i mean all three of us are in very similar situations and when my wife and i were dating we set the ground rule that if our kids didn't get along then we weren't going to continue on do you think in in both of your situations and i'll turn to you melanie first for the answer is do you think that is a viable philosophy in and we can play the what if game with, with your situation. I disagree. I think that um, biblically speaking, it's God first, marriage second, kids third. And to say our kids don't get along, so this is not going to work. I mean, the devil wins. You know, I mean, the, the divorce rate for remarriages is 75%. You know, um, it's pretty close near to 70. I mean, it's it's high. So um, it's hard, yes. But more importantly, um, if my husband and I can't model a good biblical foundation for our kids, then what's the point? Um, that's what our job is, is to lay that foundation for them through our marriage so that they can have a, a good foundation themselves to move on with their adult life. Um, so to say when it gets, you know, if they don't get along, oh, oh my gosh, mine, mine are like cats and dogs. I mean, some of it's teenage stuff. Some of it's, some of it's a mixing and a blending of, of a bunch of dynamics, but it makes you a better person. I say that today's a good day. Cause it's my birthday. It makes oh, you a happy person. birthday, <laughs> but, um, yeah, you have to really know where your priorities are. It's critical. But don't you, well, let me rephrase this. In my opinion, it was not fair to the kids to be put into a situation where they really don't have a lot of say. And that is kind of how our way of letting them be a part of this process. So, again, it, 
it's something that I just, again, I feel that if, if you're dating somebody, they have kids, you have kids that, you know, I'm not saying everything is, you know, rainbows and unicorns, but to be fair to the whole family dynamics, I just think that it's a good way to maybe start on a positive note to get the kids all on the same page. And that's why I say that is that, again, and it kind of depends on the ages of the kids as well, but I just thought that in in our circumstance, and again, it was just our circumstance, that it wouldn't be fair because the kids were eight, nine, eight, nine, twelve. No, eight, nine. And again, this is me trying to do math, but they, they were at an age where they really, I mean, they really didn't have a say in the matter. Mm-hmm. And I wanted them to have a say in the matter. Um, oh. I'll turn to you, Laura Beth. What, what's your thought? Um, I think that in the dating process, yes. I think that's a great time to address that. Um, what I think happens most of the time, though, is that that doesn't happen the the dynamics with the kids are not really even thought about um, until the families move into the same house together and you're married. And then the disagreements come in and you're like, oh, what happened? Because everything was fine, you know, a couple of months ago. Right. So um, I think, yes, absolutely. That's um, something that I think is a good way to have the kids be able to be involved in the process and be able to have a voice, um, but not after the marriage vows. <laughs> I think that's a good point, Tommy, is that you get married with rose-colored glasses on. I mean, for the most part, I mean, you do. It's like, you know, if somebody had told me all these things before I was married, um, I would have, I would have done my homework. You know, I would have, but there is no pre, I mean, people don't do premarital counseling for remarriages. They don't, you know, and if they did, they, they could involve the kids in, not that the kids get the final say, but kids want to know that they're a part of something and to, to do premarital counseling with, you know, families before they're married again is huge. And, you know, like, like Laura Beth says, nobody thinks about it. Nobody thinks about it. Well, it's it's funny you say that because I I must be the oddest duck on this planet because when my wife said to me, "Would you be willing to go to counseling before we get married so we can talk about things?" Mm-hmm. Because uh, her and I were in very similar marriages before, where we really didn't have a lot of say in the marriage. We were, uh, it was just not a good. It was just not good, and. I, I totally agree with you, Melanie, that, uh, you know, again, especially with the second marriage, the divorce rate is is way up there. And I really do believe in my heart that if just, again, just like you said, that is such great advice that you know ahead of time if you're getting into that marriage, don't be afraid to go into premarital counseling, you know, hash out things. I mean, one of the biggest things that my wife and I were probably the highest priority was talking about our finances, you know, getting our finances under one roof. It, it, honestly, it took us almost two years of our marriage to get that piece um, put together. But I think if you go into the pre uh, meriting, meriting, good word, uh, marriage counseling, I think a lot of those second marriages will be even more successful. True, false? Very true. But it's it's recognizing those families because, I mean, that's what, that's a part of our, our, our passion, Laura Beth and I, is we want to equip people. We want to equip the church. I mean, I go to a church of 10,000 people. Do you know how many of those families are blended families or step families? Or do you know how many, at least 3000 of them, you know, 
and, and, and I have to, I got to stop you right there because one of the questions I wrote down is because somebody asked me this a while back. Both of you, do you feel that blended families are now the new norm? Yes, I do. I, and, you know, and it's unfortunate, um, especially coming from a church perspective. You know, it's not uh, something that we set out, you know, to accomplish in our lifetime. So I'm going to be married twice, you know. Um, but I, I think the church is very blind to, that we are the norm now. And um, and I, th I think that if we can, and this is something that Melanie and I have um, try to, she said, equip the church on how to deal with their step families. I, I think there is a, a very big gap there in, um, in taking care of their step families. Tell, tell me more, Laura Beth, because I, I, I find it very intriguing uh, coming from, you know, being raised Catholic and, you know, that's, that's the a big no-no. You, you're not supposed to get divorced. You know, you get married one time and that's it. Better for worse until death do us part. I, and, and, I, and I firmly believe with both of you, and I agree with both of you, that the, the church does have, and when I say the church, I, and I'm talking the whole as dynamics, is it does have a, a blind eye because of what is written in the Bible. And what has the ministry done to help? And I know you said, Laura, but there is a, there's a big gap, but what has your ministry done to try and slowly uh, close that gap? Um, well, it's, uh, definitely been baby steps. Uh, what we have found Melanie and I both is, um, it's very hard to get into the church, uh, with this topic. Um, they, they will do surface work with it, but to get down into the deep, the depths of what goes on for step families uh, is not really being done. Um, on this end, uh, I was able to um, share at a women's conference that our church did and, and speak with them about the dynamics and the struggles with step parenting. Um, and Melanie has been able to uh, get into her church in a, several different ways uh, with being able to have the book even available to um, to the people that go to church there. Um, it's But it, it's very much uh, like coming up against a brick wall to try to get in, in the doors in the first place. So, uh, Melanie, tell us about the book. The book? Well... It's a 31 day devotional. Um, and so Laura Beth wrote probably 16 of them and I wrote 15, <laughs> but, uh, competition lady, I know, right? <laughs> she, she's definitely the, um, the organizer. I'm the visionary. She's, she's the get her done organizer type of thing. So we, we compliment each other nicely, but, um, we've actually written a second book, but it's laying on the floor in a box because, We've kind of taken a little hiatus um, this past year, but we're we're getting we're getting geared back up. But so the book is just it's it's a devotional, um, thirty one days with a prayer at the end of it, and um, it uh, it was a journey writing that book. What's the what's the name of the book? Laura Beth. <laughs> Daily bread for the starving stepmom. And what's the the message of the, the title? Well, like Melanie said, when the way that we met, um, my family was literally in pieces. And 
I, the Lord was telling me fight for your family. And so I was trying to find ways to fight for my family and, um, the resources just were not there and support groups were not there. And, um, I felt like I was a stepmom that was absolutely starving for resources and encouragement and somebody to understand and love me through it. Um, because there are lots of imperfections. <laughs> Being a bonus parent, a step parent, and people, a lot of people don't understand. And Melanie did, and uh, she was starving <laughs> as well. And that's just what it felt like to me. And we were doing the book, and I, I, very much an organizer. And so I thought, well, I have to put a title down and I just jotted it down really fast. And I sent her, you know, what we had been working on so that we could kind of do a short editing on what we already had. And she said, that's a great title. So we just kept it, (laughs) but it came from the heart because I was starving and Melanie, after completing the book, after it was published, did you send a copy of that book to that professor who told you that you couldn't write? No, I did not. I don't even remember that professor's name. I just remember what he said to me. <laughs> I can't yeah, right. that. Well, and the book was very... Um, inspired by the Holy Spirit simply because I would write things and my husband would come home and I'd say, he'd say, what'd you do then? I said, I wrote this and he'd read it and he'd go, you wrote that? And I go, well, not really. I, God wrote it, but I, I mean, so it was very, it was very, um, God inspired. Um, and in each devotional is a personal story, whether it's Laura Beth's or my story. Um, so it's all personalized. And it's, it's pretty raw, real. Yes. <laughs> now, it, 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 it's really funny because you both say the same thing, and, and it's, it's probably why I'm working on my third book that I need to get done. And that is you're both nailing the proverbial hammer head nail thingy. Man, I need more coffee. And that is, there's just not enough resources mm. out there for, you know, blended families. And here's the two of you creating this book, creating this, uh, you know, essentially this this great journey for blended families that are having, to to quote you both, that that starving, that need for uh, learning and knowledge on how to be. You know, a successful family to be a successful blended family. What uh, what reaction have you had uh, from the book from other blended families? Oh, I've got a reaction just last week from a friend, and I don't know if I'll be able to find it. Um, but just to paraphrase, um, I gave her one of my books about three weeks ago, and she texted me early in the morning one time last week and she says, Oh my gosh, this is just what I needed just at the right time. I mean, it's like you give somebody a cup of water that hasn't drank water for a week and they just cannot get enough water. And, um, so our feedback has been really great. I don't, I mean, don't you agree, Laura Beth? Absolutely. Um, And so people are hungry. Women are craving, they need support. They need resources. And it's just, it's hard to come by. Well, let me stop you there because this is where I get a little on my soapbox. And that is years ago when I was going through my divorce, I remember reading a a post in one of the LinkedIn groups I was a part of. And this uh, lady said that there's just no groups for moms out there. And I responded back because, again, this is me 
on my soapbox going, where are all the men groups? Where are the men groups that, you know, that, that are there for dads that are there for, you know, men to be able to speak from the heart. What message could you two give to the men out there or more importantly, maybe more towards the ladies on how to help their man, their boyfriend who uh, might be struggling, uh, very similar struggles that you two have had with your family dynamics. But what what message can you two give to your uh, ladies in arms out there? Start with you, Laura Beth. Um, this is something Melanie and I have talked about over and over and over again is that um, the men are absent from this part of the ministry. Um, and uh, not because they're choosing to be, it just is kind of that's what's happened. Um, because I assume that they feel like they're alone as well. Um, but I think the biggest piece of advice that that I have from my experience is um, absolutely supporting my husband, supporting him, understanding him, encouraging him, um, being okay with him, spending time alone with his kids, um, in, in encouraging that, in fact, and um, just uh, being a support supporting him um and did did he did he or has he had those dark times like i know you uh melanie was mentioning that you did laura beth but has he had those those struggles those mental struggles as well absolutely um you know when our family fell apart it that that was a very dark time for both of us. Um, and then when we brought our families back together and decided, you know, we were going to make this work, we're going to, this is hard, but we're going to keep at it. And his daughter decided to leave. That's, that was a very dark time for him. And um, I watched him go through depression. I watched him go through counseling and, um, and, you know, that, that sadness and that hurt manifested in different ways that has affected his life that he's had to get help for. And um, I just, I encourage people to just work through those times and find a good counselor and just support each other emphatically, support each other. We love counseling. Go ahead, Melanie. We love counseling. Yes. <laughs> counseling is a sign of strength, not weakness. No, I mean, my husband and I are seeing a counselor. For that. Thank you so much for saying that. No, it is. I mean, my husband, I mean, Laura Beth knows him well. My husband, um, we're in counseling now because, because we are so close to our situation that even though we know all the answers, we need somebody on the other side to objectively give us a different, a fresh perspective. Um, And it's strictly on parenting issues, you know, but counseling is like key. I mean, and there are not enough counselors out there that specialize in blended families, because if you're going to go to counseling on a step family, you need one that specializes in step families because organic families are different. Yes. Yes. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of change the subject just a little bit because uh, a while back the Huffington Post ran a, a picture of this family from Georgia where there was a four year old girl out on the soccer pitch and the family all has uh, jerseys on the back saying stepdad stepmom mom dad and I know that. Uh, you ladies had posted that on your Facebook page, and I had posted that on the, the Blending of the Family page. And I actually put in there, this is great for the family, but this is not the norm. 
And, you know, both of you have, you know, similar situations, but at the same time, your co-parenting is, is a little different as far as re- uh, working with uh, your spouse's former spouse. Melanie, let's start with you. What's what's co-parenting life in your household? That's non-existent. Um, you can't co-parent with irrational. And uh, <clears throat> we, um, I think, I think the issue with co-parenting is you need to know if you can co-parent or if you can't. And if you can't, then your bound it, boundaries are real big with us. I mean, we make boundaries very clear and uh like example we never ever 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 deviate from the schedule the visitation schedule ever it just creates chaos and the kids end up getting in the middle of it and it just blows up so there is no co-parenting we have tried time and time again and it's just difficult to co-parent with a person that doesn't want to co-parent. Laura Beth, you have a different situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we we have kind of both worlds going on. Um, so uh, my ex-husband and I always had a wonderful working relationship with the kids. And like I was sharing earlier, uh, we, so here in the Springs, uh, we all live in the same area. And so we would have a weekly family dinner and everybody would come together so that the kids didn't feel like they had to spend This day with this one and this day with this one, we would just be able to all come together at the same time and catch up on our weeks and how's everybody doing and laugh and joke and just have a good time together. And so that's that side. Now, the other side um, is, is pretty much non-existent as well. The court has created the boundaries um, and and we stick with those boundaries as well um, and it's it just makes things so much more difficult for the kids um, it, it's just it's rough when you cannot find a way to co-parent with someone um, it's painful in, in a myriad of ways. And not to go into, you know, great detail, because I'm sure it's all personal, but did you say that you're, you have to abide by what the court is telling you? Well, we choose, um, so my husband's ex, um, there were times where she would deviate from what was said. Theirs, theirs went through a court battles, court battle after court battle. And um, so we follow what the judge has placed in the documents so that we don't have any issues in the next court <laughs> issue um, so that we can just say, well, we've done everything that we were supposed to do. So. And I'm, I'm Melanie, you're, <laughs> I'm going to say you're very blessed <laughs> of you haven't had to, or let me refer to, have you had to deal with uh, court battles in your household? Initially, yes. Um, there was a, a court case a, a three-day court case um, for the initial uh, visitation schedule. Since then, the first year of our marriage, there were a few legal issues going on that we had to get our attorney involved in. But after that, we, we have not had any. Mm-mm. We've been blessed. Do, in, in, this is going to sound, uh, how do I phrase it without 
uh, getting the the stairs, and that is, do you, in your opinion, each of your own opinions, do you still feel that in your experience dealing with courts that they are starting to come around as far as um, seeing what's benefit beneficial for the kids, or do you still see uh, old school mentality? And when I say old school mentality, that is that the best interests for the kids are still with mom. I well, stumped the band. I think I stumped the band. Um, it is very uncommon for Williamson County to give the rights to a dad. And that's in Texas, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that, I mean, I would never want to be a family law judge ever, but I think that they do what's in the best interest of the kids. But I mean, you hear people talk about it on the other side and they're like, they don't. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, Laura Beth, maybe you can answer to that. Um, I, I've seen both. Um, I think it really, um, it, it, you have both ends of the spectrum out there with the judges. Um, with, uh, with us, um, the biological mom did not fight for custody of the kids um, until much later in the process. So the judge just gave custody to, to my husband and, um, over the years, uh, you know, we've had several court battles, uh, but have maintained custody of the kids. Um, I have a sister who the court did not, um, did not uh, see the benefits of the better parent. They just went with what was being said um, instead of uh, uh, approaching things objectively. And so I, I've seen both and I hear stories all the time of um, both sides of it. So I think it's really just kind of like, Russian roulette. Ooh. You never know what's going to happen when you walk into a courtroom. It's stressful. Melanie, let's talk about the starving stepmom and what what are the I'm going to the ministry and what's the education uh, like when you bring this. Uh, opportunity into churches? Oh, um, you know, I think that one of the reasons step families are so hard to reach is because there's a lot of guilt and a lot of shame involved with a remarriage or, I mean, you've been divorced once and now you're going to get remarried. And so I think that those people are hiding because they're in so much, you know, there's so much shame and guilt. And, you know, I'm not a perfect example of a good marriage because I'm going to have to get married again. And so trying to resource that out, trying to kind of pluck them out of the woodwork is tough. Um, you know, I do small groups. My husband and I do small groups in the church, but literally it's our small group and there might be one other. And I've got a church that 10,000 people at our church. You know, so um, there's a level of frustration there, um, definitely. And what's the curriculum? For the starving stepmom? Yes. Well, the starving stepmom, we don't really have a curriculum per se, it's other than our book. Um, our ministry is fairly a new ministry, I would say a couple years. I mean, we have a vision for our ministry and that we want to somehow, and, and, and we don't always know what this looks like as it's, as Laura Beth said, baby steps. How do we get into the churches and resource them with 
books, resource them with speakers, resource them with information, resource them with statistics about the need for helping these families out. That's our curriculum. We we haven't, that's our, our next mountain we have to climb over. And how has it been received in your church? Um, my church is supportive. However, um, I just think they're, I don't know, what is, there is a stigma, stigma, a stigma that comes with your divorce. You know, how many pastors do you know that are in a blended family? Probably 1%. Yeah. I don't know. But you know what I'm saying? There's a stigma. If we had a pastor that was in a blended family, heck, we'd probably have blended family ministry written all over our church. You'd have, you'd have 10,000 people showing up to that small group. Exactly. You know, I went to a, a Ron Deal. Are you aware of who Ron Deal is with uh, Family Life out of Arkansas? No. Um, Ron Deal is the step family guru. Ah. Yeah, Ron Deal. I would highly recommend you look up Ron Deal. But he had a summit about three weeks ago, and it was broadcast live stream throughout the, across the world. And um, uh, I lost my train of thought, Laura Beth. Back to you, Laura Beth, in the booth. <laughs> well, it, what I think of when it comes to Ron Deal, though, is the interesting thing is, is he is not from a blended family. Right. So, um, we are lacking people that have the firsthand experience mm-hmm. um, being mm-hmm. validated uh, to take on a leadership role in the step family ministry as a whole. Um, and it, it, the churches very much stick with that stigma. And uh, I think that's our biggest, mm-hmm. our biggest hurdle. Yeah. So um, as far as the curriculum, um, it's, it's interesting that every time we have um, taken on people, um, the curriculum really just presents itself because each family comes with their own dynamics mm-hmm. and their own crisis at the moment. And that's really, it's like fly by the seat of your pants because it's not the norm. It, it, everything's different. There are so many different dynamics that are brought into blended families. So. I mean, there are people popping out of the woodwork though. I mean, I have people call me weekly. Can you help? I had a gal call me yesterday with a, with a, one, a very common dynamic in a step family. She goes, what do I do? You know, I mean, these people seek us out. And we by no means have all the answers. We've been doing it 10 years. We've lived it. Yeah. But these people are starving for, for, for resources, for help, you know, and, and, and a handful, a handful, yeah, and handful of people cannot do it. Yeah. We need help, Tony. I'm here for you, ladies. <laughs> I am always here for you two ladies. I, I think you both are, are 100% right there, and, and that is, going back to our earlier conversation is, you know, you go to you know, your local bookstore or you go on Amazon, you, there's really no, uh, I, one of you said there's no roadmap and there really isn't because as you're both, you're, you both are in blended families, but you both have different dynamics. And, and it's just like you were just saying too, Melanie, every situation is different. And it, it's one of those things, like you were saying too, Laura Beth, is that is how do you develop a curriculum when when it is so different? But I really do agree with both of you that there needs to be, you know, more education and more um, support, not just not just a male female thing, because it isn't. It's it's a family dynamics. It's a family thing that they need their support. And, you know, you know, I, my own personal struggles have been uh, as of late that uh, of, of faith because you don't have 
you you really don't have that support. You you think you go to a church, you're going to be welcomed in, and I mean, I do love the church we go to, but there are just times where you're just going, ah, they don't get it. They just they just just don't get it. Yes. Uh, so what's what's next up for? Well, we know Laura Beth is moving. <laughs> Yes. What's, um, uh, what's next up for the two of you as far as moving forward with getting your your beautiful message out? Um, well, I think there's several several things that that uh, we know that we want to do, and um, first is um, getting on top of that next book that we've been sitting on for a while. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> that means editing, Tommy. <laughs> that is the editing process. I hate editing. <laughs> um, why? That's that's why I'm still stuck in my third book because I hate the editing process. Yeah. That's on the horizon. Um, also, it, I mean, we have had several meetings together where we have discussed curriculum and how to build that. And so there's a very skeleton um a piece to that out there that we're working on because it, but it's hard to figure out how to make that happen when we're hitting that brick wall, trying to get into the church mm -hmm. where that curriculum needs to be. Um, and so we have to find a way to go around that or so, yeah. So those are in, in just being available to, in, in talking to the step families in our communities, um, in our circles and just getting the word out and, um, and just building with people like you that, that have the same heart and, um, building a, a community and letting people know that they aren't alone, that they are understood so now let me just let me just play uh <laughs> devil's advocate here I, I understand that the book is a devotional but could you go outside the church i mean that's that's part of the curriculum and I, I, do you feel melanie that you could probably get a a wider audience a bigger audience even using the devotional as part of the the message part of the curriculum well um we have discussed like meeting outside the church meeting at a community center so because some people say oh it's at a church i'm not going to go to a church mm -hmm. you know um so we have discussed you know meeting at, at places other than a church um because it, it attracts those people that are, first of all, that need Christ, and second of all, that need help, whether you're, you know, a Christ follower or not, um, we can still minister to you. We will minister to you God's love, but um, because without God, we, we can't, we can't do this gig. It is impossible, impossible. What's the uh, second book about? It's just longer. <laughs> It's another, <laughs> we laugh because it's longer. It's 365 days devotional um, that each of us have written our shared amount. Um, we don't really know the style of book, how it's going to lay out. Like I said, we've been on a little hiatus this past year with lots of stuff going on. So just sharing more it, you know, it, it's interesting because these books kind of write themselves literally because every day <laughs> brings some new challenge or dynamic to a blended family. And when your kids are growing and each one is a stage of life, um, it just, the books literally write themselves. <laughs> So it just, again, very personal situations and just saying, if this is happening to me, then I'm sure that it's happening to somebody else out there. 
And so let's just join forces on this. And once again, mention the title, Laura Beth, of the first book. And where can our listeners get it? Okay, so the title is Daily Bread for the Starving Stepmom. And, uh, you know, Melanie, where, where should we tell them? Uh, you can contact us personally through social media if they want a copy of the book. Um, so our publisher has changed. And so right now it's not available on Amazon uh, for this period of time right now. Um, so, yes, contacting us personally. Okay. Um, I will, I will definitely put that information in the show notes. Any final words, ladies? How can, let me, I got one. How can the listeners help the two of you in your ministry? Start with you, Melanie. Oh, um, how can they help us? I mean, a lot of people say, when I get through this first year of my marriage, then I'll talk to people or then I'll, help you or then I no. God wants to use you now you're always going to be messed up okay we're messed up we're we're broken but it's what excuse me it's what we choose to do with our brokenness and how we choose to heal that but don't feel like you're alone in that speak now speak up now if you need help speak up I mean because there are a lot of hurting people out there and, and God uses everything at any time so You don't have to get through three years of your marriage before you think you're qualified to um, lead a small group. I mean, we need leaders. So um, he doesn't, he doesn't equip us. He he calls us. Um, And once he calls us and we accept that calling, then he equips us. So. I would agree with that. Um, Very much so. Just um, I would encourage those that are listening to just reach out. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing that um, hurts families is they just keep to themselves. And before they know it, they're isolated and alone and don't know where to go. So just be brave enough to take a step. Uh, As I mentioned i know you two are on the twitter and it's at starving starving stepmom mm-hmm. yes at starving stepmom please reach out to these wonderful ladies laura beth melanie oh my gosh thank you so much for your time and laura beth good luck with the move and oh, thank you <laughs> if you're driving if you're driving uh, anywhere near here Greeley, come on by i'll i'll, I'll make some coffee for you oh very good <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, Melanie, I'm coming to Austin. I'm come on. Often. Don't come during the summer. It's too hot. It's wonderful in the summer. No. Don't listen to it. I, I grew up in Denver. I know what cold is about, and it's too hot here. <laughs> There's nothing cold about Denver. We got great weather just because the rumor is it's supposed <laughs> to snow this week. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Blending the Family. Click here to return to your normal life.